Chapter 21 The Verdict of the Sharia Court 90% of the audience who came to attend the trial of the rebellious wife were Sudanese people. They came to see the despicable Sudanese girl who committed those hundreds of offences and stigmatised the beautiful name of Sudan. Among all her crimes, the audience singled out the abominable crime of marrying two men at the same time. Next to that hideous crime, came her terrible accusations to her Sudanese husband. How dare she to call a Sudanese man a gay and pimp who sold his wife as a sex slave to seven Saudi men? Not a single one of the two million Sudanese in Saudi Arabia believed that a Sudanese husband could do such a nefarious deed. Even Inaz's father, after he kissed Tarek goodbye at the Cairo International Airport, began to think of those unbelievable accusations, which his daughter tried to nail her highly educated husband with. How could her lawful husband who was also her first cousin gamble with her honour and virtue? Mr Ahmed Salah thought that most probably the wicked Saudi policeman invented those false accusations and put them in the mouth of his daughter. On the day of the trial, the suspect Inaz Ahmed Salah was escorted inside the Sharia court by three elephantine female guards. Each one of those gigantic policewomen equaled in size three times the body of Inaz. Shortly after the suspect was brought in, the gay, gambler, drunkard, pimp, and so-called husband of Inaz walked in. He was a free man. He was surrounded by his good-for-nothing Saudi womanizers, homosexuals, child abusers, gamblers, drunkards, and thugs. They were offered chairs in the gallery among the VIP, upper crust, elite, and cream of the society. Lastly, came the judges of the Riyadh Sharia Court. They were four in number, but none of them was a qualified judge. They were supposed to be called murderers rather than judges. Every Friday, three to five of their victims were either brutally stoned to death or cruelly beheaded. The luckiest of their victims were the ones who walked out of their criminal court with the flogging sentences. Eighty-five percent of their victims were women. Those fanatic religious judges believed that, the woman was Satan. Their prophet made them to believe, the woman comes in the form of Satan and retires in the form of Satan. So, whenever a woman was brought before them, they believed that Satan was standing before their naked eyes and therefore they judged her as a satanic creature of a sort. Very rare the so-called devil female had come inside their court and they spared her life. They loved to shed the blood of the woman more than the man. Each one of them would come in with a predetermined sentence. All four of them had already read the charges against the satanic creature Inaz and all of them had decided to shed her blood through the stones of the faithful Muslims on the following Friday. They also determined not only to condemn her to death, but to participate on her stoning too. They had already met at the Grand Mosque and discussed her abominable crime of having two husbands at the same time. They knew that, their all-wise Allah God has given that privilege to his favourite creature the man. The Almighty Allah said in his holy book, Only my darling the man is allowed to have sex with four women at the same time, Surah 4, verse 3. And if four wives aren't enough for my beloved the male, I also permit him to take to bed any number of female slaves. Even underage females are halal for sex to my adorable creature, the human male, Surah 65, 4. Many authentic hadith state that Muhammad was in his fifties when he established a marriage contract with Aisha, who was six-year-old child at the time. He consummated, had sex, with Aisha when she was nine, which is validated by all three authentic hadiths of the Qutb al sitta the six authentic collections of the hadiths, as well as other Islamic literature, such as Surat Rasul Allah, or the biography of the Prophet Muhammad. In addition, the Quran states that men can consume it, have sex with, women who have not yet had their periods, Surah 65, verse 4. All of the major hadiths and tafsir, commentaries on the Quran, support this definition. One will seemingly nowadays find Muslim apologists trying to play math games to try and ameliorate Muhammad's position, but the most authentic Islamic documents state that Aisha was nine when she first had sex with Muhammad and was eighteen when Muhammad died. 
Muslims are taught that Muhammad is the most perfect person and to emulate him in every aspect is to garner respect and grace from Allah. After rebuking the accursed devil, the four righteous judges of Allah and his prophet agreed upon the stoning sentence. They didn't waste their time in discussing Inaz other 49 offenses. They knew none of those other crimes would allow them to shed her blood. After those four religious murderers occupied their judgment seats, the fifty charges against Inaz Ahmed Salah was loudly read by a courtman. Since the Islamic Sharia court had no lawyers, Inaz was asked a few questions by the same man who read the charges. Most of those questions had nothing to do with the charges. He asked her about her age, country of origin, marital status, religion, and some other unnecessary questions. The purpose of those questions was to determine the mental condition of the suspect or rather the victim. If the courtman and the judges decided that the suspect was mentally sound, then they would hit him or her with the judgment of Allah and his Prophet. Before one of those four religious terrorists hit Inaz with the stoning sentence, they heard a voice shouting from among the audience, saying very loudly, Objection! All four judges jumped on their seats. They thought an angry terrorist was about to blow his body up and kill along with him all the crowd. I am Tariq Harun al Jabo. I was the former husband of Inaz Ahmed Salah. Although, Inaz and I were forced by a Muslim terrorist to get married to each other when we're studying in India, still I had divorced Inaz before she married her cousin Osama Hashim Salah. After speaking those saving words, Tarek took out of his suitcase a divorce certificate and walked forwards and handed it to the courtman. The courtman held the certificate not knowing what to do with it. One of the four criminal terrorists said in anger, the divorce certificate was supposed to be handed to them and not to the courtman. Out of the fear for his life, the courtman hurriedly handed the document to that angry judge. Then the four religious judges carefully examined the divorce certificate before declaring it to be valid and acceptable proof that the woman under examination didn't commit the abominable sin of marrying two husbands at the same time. One judge asked Tarek very stupid question. When you married this woman, did you find her a virgin? Tarek hesitated before he said, yes. The stupid judge asked him another question, which was more silly than the previous one. And when you divorced her, was she still a virgin? Tarek felt like grabbing a chair and throwing it at the empty-headed religious idiot. Luckily, he controlled his righteous wrath and said, How could she still remain a virgin after I had married her and deflowered her? The foolish judge realized his stupidity and therefore remained quiet. Now Tariq's mysterious manifestation in the gallery had created serious dilemma to the four judges and the audience. Each and every one of them had come with a preconceived idea about the outcome of the trial. They all expected the rebellious Sudanese wife to be judged, condemned, and sent to her executioners to stone her to death on the following Friday. Even Inaz was repeatedly told by her interrogators and guards that she was going to be stoned to death. Her wicked husband also wanted her to be stoned. He wanted to bury his crimes with her. The four judges whispered a few words among themselves before they reached a verdict. The four crazy judges had fully and completely forgotten all the other 49 offences of Inaz and collectively declared her not guilty of any crime. Therefore, Inaz Ahmed Salah walked out of the Sharia court a free woman. Chapter 22 The Fugitive Wife the verdict of the Riyadh Sharia court was rejected by everyone and that including the Riyadh police authorities. How could a woman who had committed all those 49 un-Islamic offences could walk out of the holy court of Allah a free woman? Such a ruling would encourage other Muslim women to rebel against the authorities of their husbands and fathers. Any Saudi girl could imitate the rebellious Sudanese girl and run away from her husband's house. She could even dress up as a man and roam freely in public. On the basis of which Sharia law, the four judges had absolved Inaz from those crimes of rebellion and public deception? That was the question which everybody wanted to know its answer. Some of those Sudanese who attended the trial including Inaz's husband and his evil friends had been interviewed by the media. They were all said that, 
the four judges examined only the charge of having two husbands at the same time and purposely ignored all the other 49 charges. They further said that, the former husband of Anaz appeared in person and produced evidence that he had already divorced her prior to her marriage with her cousin brother. On the basis of that, the Sharia court declared her not guilty of any crime. Due to the public protest, the fear of encouraging other women to rebel against their husbands and fathers, and the obvious error that the four judges had committed, the Riyadh police issued an arrest warrant against Anaz Ahmed Salah. In fact, the warrant was jointly issued by a senior judge and a magistrate on behalf of the kingdom, which authorized the arrest and detention of the rebellious Sudanese woman. According to this new warrant, the rebellious Sudanese wife had to stand trial again and justice had to be served in the interest of the public. A new set of religious judges was appointed to look into such serious matter. Those new judges were carefully selected by the Supreme Sharia Court. Their selection was approved by the Grand Mufti of the Islamic Houses of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. One of those new judges was interviewed by the most popular TV channel in Riyadh City. He predicted the new ruling of the Sharia Court. According to him, the rebellious Sudanese wife might get up to five years imprisonment term and 200 lashes for her all offences. The day and date of the trial were scheduled and made public through all media avenues. The populace were encouraged to attend the trial. Consequently, the scheduled retrial of the so-called rebellious Sudanese wife received more publicity than her first trial. Nevertheless, when the Riyadh police decided to re-arrest Inez, they didn't know where to find her. They searched everywhere for her, but all their efforts were in vain. They went to her husband's residence and thoroughly searched it, but they couldn't find her. They even looked for her inside the Sudanese embassy, but no diplomat supplied any information about her. After three days of intensive search, the Riyadh police announced that the rebellious Sudanese woman most probably fled out of the city. Now the police began to call her the fugitive wife. A huge financial reward was promised to any good citizen who would direct the police to her hiding place. After that, the Riyadh police began to search for her former husband who defended her in court. They thought, he might be the one who assisted her to escape or hiding her somewhere in town. No matter where the police searched for Tarek, they also could not find him. Inez's photo was displayed in every nook and corner of the capital city and other major cities such as Jeddah, Dammam, Kobar, Kamiz Mushait, and Burada. Even her photos were sent to the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. Inez had escaped from those bloodthirsty murderers through a divine intuition. It was her lover Tarek who divined the idea of an immediate escape. He knew those religious judges had made a major blunder. Thus, he anticipated that, a higher Islamic court or religious authority would definitely overrule their judgment and demand the re-arrest and retrial of Inez. Accordingly, Tarek took hold of Inez's hand as soon as she came out of the courtroom and hurried her away. He then stopped a taxi driver and gave him the address of the hotel where he was staying in. Upon their arrival, Tarek checked out of the hotel and received his passport from the receptionist and left. Meanwhile, Inez was waiting for him in the same cab. After that, the two friends went to a car rentals and rented a small car. Since Inez had no passport or any traveling documents, the lovers decided to make their escape through Yemen. The friends knew from Riyadh city the nearest countries were United Arab Emirates and the state of Qatar. But, without a passport Inez would not be allowed to enter in any one of those Gulf countries. Due to the war between Saudi Arabia and Yemen, the Saudi and Yemeni border was the only exit available for Tarek and Inez. The lovers purchased a map of Saudi Arabia and began their flight. They also bought food, many bottles of water and soft drinks, and some off-counter medications. They knew, they have to travel for many days before they would reach their destination. They had to pass through many towns and villages. Inez hid herself inside a black burqa. Everywhere they went, the lovers introduced themselves as husband and wife. When the police warrant was issued for the re-arrest of the rebellious Sudanese wife, 
the Sudanese lovers had already reached Kamiz Mushate city. Their second stop was Najran city. During their long and hazardous journey, the lovers avoided staying in any hotel or motel. They knew no hotel in Saudi Arabia would allow a man and a woman to check in unless they provide their marriage certificate or their passports in order to prove their blood relation in case of father and his daughter or brother and his sister. Wherefore, the lovers always slept in their rented car. The unjustly torn apart lovers were extremely happy when they met again after a separation of one year and a half. Although their escape was full of hardships and dangers, still the lovers counted it the happiest time of their lives. As they did in Sudan and India, Inaz and Tarek expressed their passions through hugging, kissing, and fondling. They remained faithful to their pure love. In all that time, the lovers had never have sex. But, this time Inaz promised her lover that, if they managed to reach safely to Sudan, she would demand a divorce from her cousin Osama Hashim Salah and then try to convince her father to allow her to marry her lover, Tarek Harun al -Ajabo. Tarek was extremely overjoyed, when he heard the unexpected promise of his beloved Inez. Even though, deep down in his heart, he doubted such an unattainable match. Chapter 23 Through the Valley of Death From Kamiz Mushate the fugitive lovers travelled to the city of Najran. From Najran, they travelled for some time before they crossed the border and ventured into the war-torn country of the Yemeni people. Yemen was the most dangerous place on earth when Tarek and Inaz fled to it. It was more dangerous than Syria, Libya, Somalia and Afghanistan. Every Yemeni city, town and village were considered targets for the Saudi jet fighters. Day and night, those Air Force planes bombarded the entire country of Yemen. On daily basis, the Saudi-led coalition airstrikes killed hundreds of civilians. Wherefore, Yemen could be correctly called a war zone country. The war plagued the country with many curses. Due to lack of food, people were starved to death. War, plague, and famine destroyed the lives of thousands of Yemenis. The Saudi-led coalition had continued to escalate its campaign against Iranian-backed Houthi rebels, resulting in heavy civilian casualties. Moreover, the cholera epidemic claimed the lives of thousands. The horrific conflict and humanitarian crisis in Yemen has reached unspeakable limits. In the midst of intensified attacks, stark famine and a cholera epidemic, civilians were paying a devastating price. Children were turned into skeletons. Five million children were especially at risk for starvation, dangerously on the edge of mass deaths. With hospitals and schools damaged and water in very short supply, immediate action was needed. That was the sad situation in the war-torn country of the Yemenis, when the fugitive lovers arrived there. Their final destination was the coastal region of Hodeida. They planned to seek the help of the UN officials upon their arrival in that city. If they managed to reach safely the city of Hodeida, the lovers wanted to flee through the assistance of the UN workers to Djibouti. From Djibouti they decided to escape to Somalia. From Somalia, they would travel to Kenya. When they would reach to Kenya, they would either try to get some travelling documents to their fatherland or else seek refugee asylum at Nairobi city. Due to the long-lasting civil war, Somalia was called the Lonely Planet. It was a failed state. It was the second dangerous country after Yemen. Without exaggeration, every male in the Somaliland was fully armed and dangerous terrorist. On daily basis, women were raped, flogged, and stoned to death. Female children as small as eight to nine years old were given in marriage to men as old as their fathers or grandfathers. Every Somali girl was genitally mutilated since early childhood. Due to that barbaric procedure of female genital mutilation, many of those child brides would be raped to death on their first wedding nights. It took Tarek and Inez over a month to reach the city of Hodeida. During that long and hazardous trip, the lovers were taken captives twice by the Houthi rebels. In both events, they miraculously escaped. At their first captivity, the building in which they were imprisoned was partially destroyed through an air strike. 
their captor fled for his life. The lovers fled too. In their second confinement, an internal conflict suddenly erupted between the Houthi militiamen and some armed local Yemeni people. The cause of the deadly fight was a dispute over food supplied by the UN. The armed Yemenis defeated the Houthi rebels and freed all their war prisoners. The lovers were among those lucky prisoners who escaped the brutality of the Houthi rebels. By then, Tarek and Anaz had already lost their rented vehicle after they spent five days in that lawless land. Their vehicle was robbed at the gun pointing. Luckily, the Yemeni guys who robbed their car didn't gang rape Anaz. They only forced Tarek to empty his pocket and hand the key of his car to them. So, the rest of their trip was done either on foot or through a donkey ride. Their miserable situation compelled them to steal a donkey from a Yemeni shepherd boy. They travelled by the donkey for many days before their slow beast of burden died of lack of food. They travelled most of those horrifying days, while they were starving and penniless. At the Hodeida city, the lovers didn't get what they wanted. The workers of the UN wouldn't allow anyone to onboard in any of their ships. Nonetheless, the lovers were secretly smuggled inside a refugee's ship by a good Samaritan. Their helper understood their urgent need and had pity on them and therefore allowed them to travel in one of the UN's ships. He was a Somali man who was a citizen of Djibouti. By then, the lovers' external conditions would melt the heart of the devil. They lost so much flesh due to the many days of going on without food or water. Sometimes, necessity for survival forced them to eat grass like wild beasts. Other times, they drank water from gutter. In fact, gutter water was a rarity in that value of death. When the fugitive lovers boarded that UN ship, they were dressed up in rags. The son of one of the five richest men in Khartoum and the daughter of the proudest man in Sudan were dressing up in rags and starving to death in the poorest country in the world. Whether one called it a miracle or a rare luck, the couple life was snatched from the jaws of death upon their arrival in Djibouti. So, they did not need to venture into the second dangerous country in the world, the land of terror and terrorists, Somalia, and hoped to survive among the deadliest terrorist groups in the planet Earth. Tarek was able to contact his wealthy daddy in Khartoum and informed him about their miserable conditions and their whereabout. Again, it was the same kind Somali man who helped Tarek to phone his father and break to him the good news of their miraculous exit out of the kingdom of Tartarus. For over a month, the lovers' families were receiving many conflicting reports about the fate of their children. One report said, they were kidnapped by the Saudi police and cruelly murdered. The Saudi police flew them in a helicopter and threw them alive in the dangerous desert of the empty quarter. Another report mentioned that, Inaz and Tarek were kidnapped by some angry people immediately after the trial was over, and no one knew where they took them or what they did to them. Yet, one more report stated that, the friends fled as soon as they left the courtroom and likewise no one had an idea where they fled to or whether they were alive or dead. This last report was confirmed by the Riyadh police when the lovers' families contacted the Saudi police authorities. Inaz's father contacted her husband in Riyadh and from him, he received hundreds of lies about his daughter and her lover Tarek. The nastiest of those lies were the ones which said that, Inaz was always in contact with her lover Tarek. He falsely claimed to have caught her many times talking to him on the phone. He also said, one night, while they were sleeping in bed, Inaz got up and went out of their bedroom and sat on the balcony and began to write a love letter to her boyfriend Tarek. When he woke up and didn't find her sleeping besides him, he saw the light was on in their balcony. He then tiptoed and caught her red-handed. In his anger, he burned the letter and put its ashes in a water and forced her to drink it. Furthermore, the wicked husband said, for long time Inaz refused to allow him to have sex with her. After he caught her many times, she openly confessed her love for Tarek and demanded a divorce. Osama then said to his father-in-law, the improper behaviors of Inaz had compelled him to beat her many times. The gay husband falsely claimed that, when he slept with Inaz he didn't find her to be a virgin girl. When he questioned her, without shame, 
she had admitted that her virginity was claimed by her lover Tarek. He also added that, he had impregnated her on purpose in order to block her chance of leaving him and going back to Sudan and marrying her lover. Eventually, she ran away from him and went to the Sudanese embassy and falsely accused him of being a gay, drunkard, gambler, and pimp who sold his wife as a sex slave to his Saudi friends. She also falsely claimed that, she was impregnated by one of those seven Saudi men who raped her inside her husband's house and with his knowledge and consent. The evil husband then thanked his Allah because neither the embassy of Sudan nor the Riyadh police authority had believed a single accusation against him. Finally, Osama said, he strongly believed that, his wife had run away with her lover as soon as those foolish judges of the Sharia court had erroneously declared her not guilty of any crime. The gay husband concluded his false report by saying, he would never give an as divorce, and she shall remain his wife until her death or his death. The Sudanese lawyer, Mr. Ahmed Salah became extremely outrageous upon hearing those nasty reports about his daughter. Shortly, after talking to his lost and found son, the Sudanese business tycoon, Mr. Harun al Jabo, flew in his private jet from Khartoum to Djibouti city. On the following day, the dead and miraculously resurrected two lovers were flown back to the capital of Sudan. Accordingly, the runaway Sudanese wife, Inaz Ahmed Salah had been brought back to her fatherland without the need for a passport or an airfare. Chapter 24 The Domestic Violence Inaz's father had already been informed by Tariq's father about the miraculous escape of the two friends and their whereabouts. So, such information reached the ears of the proud Sudanese lawyer before his daughter and her lover arrived safely in their motherland. This time, Mr. Ahmed Salah didn't show interest in travelling with Mr. Harun al Ajabo in his private jet to Djibouti city and receiving with outstretched arms his lost and found beloved daughter Inez. Also, when the two friends arrived at the Khartoum airport, the Sudanese lawyer wasn't there to receive his dead and resurrected daughter. The lovers expected to be received by Inaz's father as brave heroes who returned from the enemy front line, after courageously fought a deadly battle and won. But, so far the attitudes of the proud Sudanese lawyer had astonished and puzzled them. Even Mr. Harun al Ajabo sensed something wasn't right about his former neighbor's reaction to the safe return of his daughter and her friend. Wherefore, from the Khartoum International Airport, he decided to take Inaz directly to her parents' house. He rejected the request of his son to allow Inaz to come and dine first in their residence before sending her to her family. It was the proud Sudanese lawyer who responded to the bell ringing and opened the door. He was immediately followed by his wife, Mrs. Saham Salah. The two parents looked tense and angry. They neither greeted nor responded to the greetings of Mr. Harun al Ajabo when he smilingly greeted them. They also didn't request them to come inside their house. How dare you to leave your lawful husband and ran away with a boy who is neither your husband nor your brother? Mrs. Saham screamed on the face of her daughter. And before Inaz could respond to the question of her angry mother, her outrageous father hit her with another question. And how dare you to accuse your husband and first cousin Osama Hashim Salah with those malicious accusations? Was it for the sake of this Karabi boy you ran away from your husband and created all this drama because you wanted to be with him? Mrs. Saham resumed her attack on her daughter. And you Tarek, did I tell you to go and kidnap my daughter from her lawful husband and be with her all alone for over a month? Did I not request you in front of your father to go and prove in court you had already divorced Inez before she had married her cousin Osama? If you have a sister resumed the fire-breathing Mrs. Saham, would you allow her to leave her husband and travel for over a month with a man who has no any blood relation with her? You stupid and bad girl, thundered Mr. Salah in rage, how dare you to accuse the son of my brother Hashim of being a gay? Yes he is, Inaz exploded at last, and he is worse than a gay. He is a useless and dirty Sudanese man who had gambled with the body of his lawful wife. For money's sake, he had sold my thighs to his evil Arab friends. Through gambling, he allowed seven of his Saudi friends to rape me inside his house and in his bedroom. If I ever see him again, 
I shall kill him with my own hands. Shut up Inez, Mr. Salah shouted on top of his voice, I swear by the honor of my father, if you ever dare to speak those lies again about my good and highly educated nephew, I would cut your tongue and burn your body with fire. Osama is the son of Arabs and the son of tribes, Mrs. Saham shouted very loudly, neither a girl from your father's family nor your mother's family has ever made such nasty accusations against her lawful husband. Your husband Osama has caught you many times talking on the phone with this boy. Without shame you left your husband sleeping and went to the balcony and began to write a love letter to Tarek. Your husband caught you red-handed and burned your disgraceful letter and forced you to drink its ashes. No, these are Osama's lies. I had neither talked nor written to Tarek. Before I ran away from Osama's house, I had never spoken to Tarek since the day you had assaulted me and almost killed me in India. Inaz is right, Tarek spoke at last, we had not contacted each other for over a year and a half. Listen Tarek, Mrs. Saham responded, Inaz is a married woman. She has a husband. You have no right to go to Saudi Arabia and kidnapped her from her lawful husband. I am telling you in front of you father. Stay away from my daughter. If you thought, we are going to ask her to divorce her husband Osama and marry you, that abominable deed would never happen as long as Inaz has a father and a mother alive. Moreover, Osama talked to me and told me that he would never divorce his wife Inaz. He further said to me, Inaz shall remain his wife until her death or his death. Only death would set them apart. Mr. Ahmed Salah and Mrs. Saham Salah, Mr. Harun Alajabo said in deep voice, My son Tarek and I have not come to your house to beg you to give us your daughter's hand in marriage. We have just brought to you your daughter. My son Tarek has sacrificed his study and put his life in great danger because he wanted to save the life of your daughter Inez. From today onwards, Tarek and Inaz roads would be parted forever. No, Inaz screamed in anger, Tarek is my lover and we shall remain boyfriend and girlfriend forever. Don't forget you are still a married woman and have a lawful husband. The proud Sudanese lawyer, Mr. Ahmed Salah could no longer control his boiling anger. So when his married daughter had openly confessed her love for the Karabi boy, he struck her face until he knocked her down. His foot quickly hit her waist. Inaz screamed loudly from the terrible pain. Mrs. Saham joined her angry husband and removed her shoe and went into a hysterical rage and hit her fallen daughter many times on her head. Inaz began to roll over and over as her parents went on and on mercilessly hammering her. The Sudanese business tycoon Mr. Harun Alajabo took hold of his son's hand and walked to his car. Tarek could still hear the screaming of his beloved Inez after his father's car drove a block away from the crime scene. Once again, it was the neighbors who rescued Inez from her second honor killing attempt. But, this time no one had called the police or the hospital ambulance. In Sudan, a father or a husband could beat his disobedient daughter or rebellious wife on the middle of the main street and no one has the right to stop them. Even the police have no right to interfere in such a domestic violence. It is an absolute right granted by Allah the Almighty to his favorite creature, the male, which has been revealed in the Divine Book of Muslims, the Holy Quran, Surah No. 4, Verse No. 34. Chapter 25 the House of Obedience After a couple of good neighbors came in and begged the furious parents to spare the life of their only child, Inaz was locked up inside a dark dungeon. She was bleeding and her many injuries were torturing her with so much pain. Luckily, this time she wasn't attacked with the intention of slaying her in an honor killing. Her parents just wanted to stop her from confessing her love to a black Karabi boy and also preventing her of accusing her husband of being a gay and pimp. Her proud and arrogant parents would never accept her those two daring actions. They believed the lies of her husband. After hearing his reports, they concluded that, their daughter did what she did because she wanted to find an excuse to break up her marriage and then marry the Karabi boy. Now Tariq's father had heard enough insults and humiliation to his son and to him. 
Calling a Sudanese person a Karabi on his face is same like calling a person a slave or Negro. It is a racially loaded term. Mr. Harun al Ajabo had been so insulted that day, but he was such a gentleman who could control his temper. From the time his son returned from India, he became aware of the mad love between Tarek and Inaz. Nevertheless, he knew and understood that, the two lovers were unmatchable. A girl whose parents from the Shajia and Jalia tribes, her family would never allow her to marry a boy whose parents from the Fur and Noba tribes. In accordance, he decided to put an end to the fruitless friendship of his African son and the Arab girl. When he reached his residence, he narrated to his wife what had happened and both parents warned their son from contacting the Arab girl again. The parents also reminded their son that, Inaz was a married woman. Tariq's mother cast serious doubt on Inaz's love for her son. According to her, if Inaz was true in her love for Tariq, she wouldn't have agreed to marry another man. So, Tariq's hope to marry his beloved Inaz was dashed forever. After the sad confrontation with her parents, at last, Tarek came to term with the bitter reality that, Inaz and he were simply not made for each other. Consequently, he decided to forget about the Arab girl and look for a girl who would love him and accept him as a matchable life partner. After a week from the day of his return to Sudan, Tariq's parents sent him back to Egypt to pursue his engineering study. Meanwhile, Inaz was facing many problems. Some were at home and some were legal issues. At home, in that fateful day, Inaz hadn't only lost her lover forever, but the cruel beating of her angry parents had caused her to miscarry her baby. Her mother called in a nurse and then bribed her for the private treatment of her badly hammered daughter. After that, the so-called disobedient daughter was subjected to an indefinite house confinement. The Riyadh police authority somehow came to know that, the runaway fugitive Sudanese wife had reached Khartoum. Accordingly, they were trying to convince the Khartoum police authority to send her back to Saudi Arabia for the finalization of her incomplete trial. Nevertheless, the Sudanese lawyer exercised his legal authority and blocked that demand. Mr. Ahmed Salah learned through the media, if his daughter was sent back, she would be jailed for five years and flogged two hundred lashes. Her so-called husband, Osama also learned that, his runaway wife had returned to her family and hence asked her parents to send her back to him. The parents told him that, Inaz had threatened to burn herself alive, if they tried to force her go back to her husband. Osama didn't give in to her life threat. He also counter-attacked her threat by uttering his threat too. He threatened to take the matter to the Sharia court and demand the issuing of Hak Maltat, Law of Obedience. He would also request the Riyadh Sharia court to bring his disobedient wife to Beit Altat, House of Obedience. Inaz was crying day and night, when she heard about the possibility of dragging her from her parents' house by the police authority and chaining her to her seat inside a plane and taking her back to her evil husband. The proud Sudanese lawyer knew all the Islamic laws regarding the disobedient wife. So, Mr. Ahmed Salah understood. If the Sharia court issued the Haq Malta and the Beit Alta against his daughter, he could do nothing to stop the police authority from fulfilling their duty. If he attempted to stop them from accomplishing their duty, he would be breaking the law, and would be held responsible for obstruction of justice. As a lawyer, he swore at the time of his graduation to uphold justice even if that had to be against his dear ones and other family members. Nonetheless, the proud Sudanese lawyer, Mr. Ahmed Salah had determined not to leave a stone unturned in order to stop his daughter from being dragged by the police authority from his house and taken to Beit Altat, the house of her husband in Riyadh City. Before we end this chapter, let us explain to the non-Muslim readers, the Haq Maltat and Beit Altat. Under the Islamic Sharia law, there is an Islamic law called Haq Maltat, which means the obedience sentence. This law is usually issued by the Sharia court against any married Muslim woman who refused to join her husband in his house or left his house without any lawful reason and went to her parents' house or ran away and hid herself somewhere else without his permission or against his wish. Physical abuses such as beating or raping are not considered sufficient grounds for the wife to desert her husband. 
When the Sharia court issued that law it would send a police truck full of cops to the place where the disobedient wife is staying or hiding herself. The cops have the rights to beat, drag, force, and whatever other means of coercion they find necessarily to use to transfer that rebellious wife to her husband's house. If her close relatives such as her father, brothers, uncles, or cousins stood on their way then the policemen are also empowered by the law to apply force against those relatives who tried to obstruct justice. They can beat them or arrest them and if need required they can kill them too. Now, when that first round is performed successfully whether through shedding of blood or not, then the cop's duty is over and the rest is left for the husband. What the policeman had done so far is called in the Sharia applying Hak Maltat or the obedience law. In other words, they had carried out the order of the Sharia court by taking the disobedient wife from where she was found to the Beit Altat, or the House of Obedience. The Beit Altat is worse than a maximum security prison. This house can be any locked-up room inside the husband's house. Even a storage room or toilet can be used for this purpose. The disobedient wife would be imprisoned inside that small room or hut indefinitely. During her confinement, she would be denied all her rights as a human being including her basic needs. She would be starved deliberately, beaten up continuously, and raped daily by the man she doesn't want to live with, her husband. This harsh treatment would continue until her devils leave her head and her spirit of resistance and disobedience crumbles. Many Muslim clerics teach that after Eve disobeyed God and ate the forbidden fruit, she became permanently possessed by him, Satan. Therefore, every woman is inherently possessed by devils and her head always haunted by jinn and ghosts. Imprisoning the disobedient wife in the Beit Altat is part of the Sharia's teachings. The matter is not just left for the husband to do it or not. It is compulsory and considered part of the process of curing the rebellious wife and delivering her from her stubborn nature, inherited at birth. Having explained that inhumane law, let us now proceed with the heartbreaking life story of Inaz Ahmed Salah.